Africa, you, you'll see the jollof. You know, you go to the Caribbean, you might see Haitian black rice, you'll see coconut rice. And then in the South, I grew up on rice like it was no other. And everyone also hears the version of rice and peas or rice and beans. So this is all what it is put all together. So I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, I'm very excited that, um, to share this menu with you. And again, um, I just cook with a lot of love. That's, that's, that, that's the biggest ingredient that I do, which I implore everybody to operate off that um, particular frequency, especially in these times right now, because love is like um, the highest vibration that we can operate from, and it actually heals a lot of sickness, you know? So again, stay in those spirits, especially these times that, that, that we are um, transitioning into. And I guess the, the, the word has been overused is the new normal, but that's what it is. I'm pretty sure everyone in here has been a part of like three or four or five, if not more, some type of Zoom events. So this is what uh, it's come to, and we're making the best of it. And listen, I'm excited to be here, and I can't wait to even come back next year, hopefully in the flesh. Wonderful. Awesome. And I'm just going to show a short clip of something delicious that um, Chef Santana has prepared um, in the past. So I'm just going to do a quick screen share. If Ashley could um, grant me ho hosting capabilities. Okay, here we go. Oops, what happened to the video? Oh, here it is. Here we go. Okay, so thank you so much for, um, for sharing uh, your delicious experience with us, um, um, Chef Santana. And what we're going to do is we're going to share the longer um, cooking demonstration in the, in the chat box um, before the evening is over. So you all can just literally take that link and copy it into your browser and watch it whenever you want to. Um, but so without further ado, um, we will introduce tonight's um, panel. Um, we have uh, Ms. CCH Pounder, um, Gia Hamilton, and Larry Ose Mensa um, in conversation. And just to give you some context, this year's focus is Noir Noir meditations on African cinema and its influence on visual art. So this year, the fair, all of the work that's curated, our panels, our screenings are revolving around the idea of how art from the, from the, from the diaspora and from Africa is influenced by film from Africa and the diaspora. So the intersection between contemporary art and film is essentially what the fair this year is focusing on. And I think this panel is an amazing group of folks who have so much knowledge on culture broadly, but then also um, visual arts and film that um, I think you'll, you all will get, you're, all, you're in for a treat tonight, essentially. So let's start but with some bio, shall we? Um, CCH Pounder is a philanthropist our collector and actress who has appeared across film, theater, and television. Pounder is widely recognized for her screen roles like medical examiner Dr. Loretta Wade on NCIS New Orleans and Detective Claudette Wims on The Shield imbuing fictional characters with wisdom and serene intensity. An impassioned arts patron, Pounder's personal collection contains over 500 works of art featuring artists of the Caribbean, African, continent and African diaspora. Um, then we have Ms. Gia Hamilton, um, who is an applied anthropologist who employs social magic methodology to investigate land, labor, and cultural production while examining social connectivity within institutions and community. As a model builder, Hamilton co-founded an independent African-centered school, Little Maroons in 2006, 
Later, she opened a creative incubator space called Gree Gree Lab in 2009 and designed and led the, jo the Joan Mitchell Center Artist Residency Program in New Orleans as a consultant from 2011 to 2013. Um, Gia is currently the chief curator or and executive director of the New Orleans African American Museum. And Larry Ose Mensa uses contemporary art as a vehicle to redefine how we see ourselves and the world around us. Um, the Ghanaian American curator and cultural cur critic has organized exhibitions and programs at commercial and nonprofit spaces around the globe from New York City to Rome, featuring artists such as Fidele Baez, Allison Janae Hamilton, Brendan Fernandez, Ebony G. Patterson, Madhu Dieng, Glenn Kano, Jody Minaya, and Stanley Whitney, to name a few. Moreover, Ose Mensa has actively documented cultural happenings featuring the most dynamic visual artists working today, such as Derek Adams, Micheline Thomas, and Dejeka Akonin Lee Crosby, and Federico Solmi, and Kehinde Wiley. So I will let you lovely folks um, start your conversation. Well, thanks, first of all, for the introduction, Mikhail. And I'm delighted to host yes. Gia Hamilton and Larry Oste Mensa. Larry, it's so nice to actually be able to talk to you uh, mano a mano, mouth to mouth, or not hand to hand. Um, the idea of hosting something like this this evening is really to see if we've even sort of moved forward just a little in terms of what we see in film, what we see in the art within the diaspora. Um, one of the things that I was really wanted to set up is that to me, African art is a newspaper. And as opposed to seeing works of complete abstraction, you will see the situation of the day, whether it be political or social, or otherwise. And so um, I don't know if you had a, a chance to uh, screen any of the films that are being shown at the prison art fair. It's actually not necessary for this conversation, but what it does do is it sets um, a time slot that a film done in 72, a film done in 89, has a remarkably similar trajectory about who and what we are and how we're doing. So that's how I'd like to start our conversation. And first of all, if you agree with me in any way, um, may, perhaps you can talk with yourselves, amongst yourselves, about what you think is happening now. And I'd love to be your ear on that. Gia, do you want to go first? I feel like you set that up so perfectly. You know, um, and just thinking about the films, um, Samping Zanga, um, which of course came out in 1972, and just thinking about um, just like where we are politically, globally, where we are um, right now as Black Americans, as we as we shift a kind of um, you know have a a big political shift, and just all of the sort of um, various sort of political movements that happened in in the United States this year and just thinking about the documentation of that and how um, the, the sort of mechanics of civil war and the way in which artists respond to those political movements is is it's just it, it felt like this is such an uh, appropriate film for us to see to, to do exactly what you're talking about to see like what are the cycles you know that just happen um with, within the context of like just how we are as people how we evolve and then um it left a lot of questions for me around like where do we go and what are what what's the role of of the artist now you know not simply documentation um but how do how do artists how do contemporary artists in particular help us to envision what is possible in the world so there there was just there i feel like it left a lot of questions for me um not a ton of analysis but just like wow, these films really hit home in terms of, um, of, of real issues that we are contending with right now. Uh, Larry, what, what were your, some of your thoughts? Uh, well, first, thank you for joining. Well, allow me to join you both in conversation. Thank you to Prism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think piggybacking on what you said, the inheritance and 
uh, was it When Liberty Falls? Is that the other film? The documentary? Yeah, When Liberty Burns. Yeah. Um, just piggybacking on your point, one, about art being a newspaper, but then two, reflective of this moment. But I think for me, it's also just been a reminder, you know, um, of the spectrum of conversations and the spectrum of issues um, that need to be addressed and constantly need to be addressed. Um, like over the weekend, I was watching Small Acts. You know, I watched the first two, um, the miniseries by Steve McQueen with um, so Mangrove and then Lover's Rock, which both beautifully shot, but very different films, but giving you a sense of what is, you know, Black Caribbean British life like. And to see myself and I think we're now becoming more aware that um, a lot of the issues that we think to be kind of U.S.-centered things are actually global issues for Black and brown folks. I mean, just last week, we saw what happened in France yeah. with the police officers who I believe have been charged with assaulting a Black man. Um, so, because I was talking to an artist earlier, uh, Greg Breda, and we were talking about the fact that, you know, we've kind of been censored to a degree, if we live in the States with regard to like what's happening outside of the US. And so I love the curation and selection of films that kind of remind us that there are different issues, you know, macro, micro, that we can connect to, but that is important for us to be aware of, hopefully helps us find inspiration to definitely kind of like navigate this moment, you know, because I think as much as we rely on artists, it's also the question of how can we um, be agents of change just as human beings? You know, because I've talked to artists who, you know, they say, I, I haven't been able to make anything. You know, yeah. I'm still processing, I'm still sitting. Um, and so I think it's reminded me to be careful to not just put that on the artists, the filmmakers, the dancers, the musicians, but also my role as a curator. You know, what can I do to be of support you know and and be a sounding board if 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 needed i couldn't help but notice that the entire era of of our filmmaking there's something about it that hasn't changed hmm. and that it reminded me that change is a massive thing it moves slowly and it's like a a, a real slug and then it takes always some extreme crisis to kind of bring something into focus and you might make a leap a temporary leap for a moment and then you seem to be like wait a minute weren't we here before haven't we been talking about these issues before and so to see in film and the mirror of that film in art which to me i'm really seeing now i'm thinking of um Kine Ao, Senegalese artist, with her painting of the stoning. I'm thinking now of thousands and thousands of, of paintings of uh, Brianna, of, of Floyd, of, that they've, they've just leaped into the air saying, and it's as if an artist cannot avoid it. So when I say art as newspaper, film as newspaper, I don't think that we're going to go forward with the kind of speed that my still young brain is ready for. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah I, see your, I see your mouth forming to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? I, I mean, if we think about how much information we have access to, how much content we have access to, um, it's kind of, it, 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 it really is sort of mind boggling to to think that like you said we're still as as society as 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 human beings having to move at the pace that we are among around the things that we're holding on to right which is which is really i mean centered around power and access yeah. to resources and how you know like that, that's both a theme um for black and brown people around the globe 
um, that artists certainly, you know, document and think about, but they also experience it, right? Um, like in their in their own and everyday lives, um, you know, what, what filmmakers and artists have to go through in order to create that piece, right? In order to promote that piece or even, or even be able to have it, um, shown you know to to the general public that they're trying the, the audience that they're trying to get it to and so it's it's um i really think about like well what what is that bridge between all of the access that we have right it's it's not a lack of access anymore it's not a lack of information or content or things for us to think about um so so what is it that that actually uh prevents us from from moving uh at a different pace and um, I just, I can't help but reflect on this relationship that we have to like um, in, 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 the, in the West or in this capital system, like that we love the, the work that's created, but we don't always support the artist that is, you know, that is creating the work. And, you know, I, Cece, of course, you as a, as a collector and fierce defender of the artists know all about that. So you know, I, I actually kind of have that question for you. Like when you're thinking about the support to the artist to create work in the now, like what goes into that sort of decision-making? How do you, how do you kind of figure out who needs what right now and how you as a collector support that? Well, it was never more clear actually than during the time of COVID. This was the time, and I, I um, follow Larry on Instagram and it appeared as if you were everywhere. It was amazing. And, um, and doing artist visits, doing them by Zoom, by physically being there. I never quite knew which state you were in next and or which country. And how did you manage to get in and out like that? Or were these old um, uh, photographs? But um, it, this was actually the time to support artists. It was also the time to uh, free yourself of... Um, who tells you what to collect. Mm -hmm. uh, you're great influencers in terms of what to collect. And it was a great time to kind of go discovering, make your own choices. And when it arrived at the door, because that was also the mystery, is that uh, this medium can either enhance or make it not as um, lacking the depth that it might have and when it actually gets in your hands, then you have to decide like, oh, so that's what it was. Or I thought it was this big, but it's this big. And there are all those things that, that go into it. But I think it was the greatest of pleasures to be able to have these um, date-like conversations with artists where you've never met them, but you're having, to me, during the time of COVID, very intimate conversations about what's going on where they were. For instance, I knew very little bit about SARS in Nigeria. And that situation, I had no idea had gotten so out of hand, so ridiculous in terms of how they were attacking people. And the, the state, this is, a, this is an arm of the state police trying to keep things in order. And bribery involved and how hard it was for you to get from point A to point B without somebody sticking their hand out, give me that, give me your phone, give me your, you know, and um, under the guise of, of police, uh, uh, the police guys. And um, I learned that from an artist. And when I made a comment on it, 10 artists chimed in, chimed in, said, this has gone on too long. And so my eyes were opened up through art to a completely different uh, political scene um, that was ironically remarkably similar to the scene that was in the United States. And so we find ourselves now knitting these situations and taking a, a new look at, at us as a, a global citizen, as opposed to, well, over here in my state, these and other words like that um, were taking advantage of me while now I can pool resources, tell you what's happening here, how it's being done, what we're doing about it, and send that information to those artists and citizens in other places. So that was the huge power of 
COVID, first of all, time. You had extra time to do things. Um, and you, I learned so much more. And I found that Larry was also in this situation because from what I read on, on your uh, sites, um, you were also aware of these new and or old things that were going on, Larry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the one, if I'm thinking about what COVID has kind of catalyzed in this moment, um, I think we're seeing a lot more conversations around infrastructure. Yes. Um, so if we're talking about how do we accelerate change, a lot of it was that, you know, in front of the camera, there might have been adjustments, but behind the camera, same faces, same issues. And so I think it's actually been amazing to see across industries, not just the arts, but across industries, this reckoning where people are just like, okay, you know, what does your board look like? You know, yeah. for example. Um, and really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of like how these things are built, how these things are supported, um, you know, shaming some some entities. Um, but again, for me, it's always been the emphasis of it's not enough to hire a black director, a black screenwriter, a black curator, but like what infrastructure are you putting in place to make sure that they can do what you've hired them to do? What infrastructure are you putting in place to create a pipeline? What does mentorship look like? Um, so I think that's one, one thread that I've been thinking about. And I think the second thing, because, you know, although I've been able to, you know, move to a degree, it's not how it was pre-COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, for me, so much of the practice is connecting with artists. Um, and you know, you, you do a studio visit and you get reminded, oh wow, this feeling that I have right now, this joy is why I do it, whether it's virtually or physically. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also, you know, what's been great is that there has been this kind of like flattening or true globalization. Like, you know, I, I'm an insomniac, I like, scrolled on Instagram this morning and like a buddy of mine, he's an exec, film exec in LA and he's from Dominica, I believe. And no, St. Vincent. And he's wrote this like soliloquy on why Lovers Rock was like one of the most important films about like, you know, blues parties and like, which I, you know, I know about a rent party. That's not a new idea. Mm -hmm. but Like just something like of that film that, Steve creates and then looking at the stills, you know, from certain scenes that really could be a photograph within itself. And like, you know, watching the film, because I was watching the film like you watch a movie mm -hmm. and realizing that this was a love letter um, and that it was an art piece. And so I think my, my sense of awareness is heightened because going back to what you said, we have more time to kind of delineate you know, not necessarily what's good or bad, but what you respond to and what you don't. Um, and I think there's this hunger for more yeah. that we all have in terms of like, you know, if we're talking about newspapers, okay, I don't want to read the New York Times anymore. You know, what is The Guardian saying in South Africa? You know, you know, what are all these different kind of, you know, publications if we're using the artist as kind of the metaphor for that? Um, and also to see the excitement, like I'm going to Ghana in a couple of weeks to see family. Can we come with you? You're more than welcome. You and to I are available. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting to like witness in, and part of it is market driven, but the other part I think is like an earnest interest in like all these artists coming up from Ghana. And like you can, I think that's also the other thing is that you can be an artist, um, wherever you are and don't necessarily have to come here to create you know you can create in ghana you can create in nigeria you can like you know some of them are not necessarily even interested in coming here you know they're interested in you know you know expanding their creative reach you know but beyond that you know they like their life where they are um and so that's been illuminating like an artist like basil kincaid who's from st louis who said, I'm fed up, I'm moving to Ghana, and moved, you know, and that's his base. 
Okay. And it'll be exciting to see the type of work he makes in response mm -hmm. to being in that environment and being, you know, for him, more connected to uh, a, a different kind of cultural center for himself. So it's this year, and I would say the last couple years, it's just things are shifting, you know, and I think we're just a lot more mentally, physically, spiritually aware. Um, and I think we're, we're articulating that in the things that we support, the things that we advance, the things that we post, the things that we center in our conversations. And, um, you know, I think the goal is to continue that, but then to continue to push for these infrastructural adjustments. You know, you know, I love the fact that all these films, to my knowledge, are independent films. How do we continue to celebrate independent, independent storytelling and not necessarily something that requires the machine you know to 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 engage a broader audience i feel like to that to that point specifically like i think about um the time frames that some of these films were created right like you know like a last like a couple of weeks you know where you're in you're very focused you're getting work done because you really are like capturing like a moment in time like as you said cc and how um you know having venues and institutions that are willing to like open up their swath of you know of what it is that they show and how they show things right and for me it's funny i've been on the other end of like two years of like institutional work at the new orleans african american museum you know trying to reopen an institution and like really thinking about the collection um so even just going back to this uh, unveiling cc it's been like this you know, as, as we're like doing condition reports and thinking about the work that we have in our collection, it's been um, these little surprises of things that we didn't know we had in our collection. And just thinking about how, you know, um, how important it is to be doing institutional work um, and to be, and to really think about new models um, and how artists intersect with those models, right? And for me, that's been a lot of like um, breaking down some barriers around power and being really transparent about what that means so that um, there is a real partnership between curatorial work, artistic work and institutional work, right? Like how do those things symbiotically work together? And I think about like, you know, um, the way in which film and, and, and video is shown now and how important it is, it is and is going to be in the future. Like, uh, for instance, we at the museum, you know, we, we hosted uh, Garrett Bradley's film America. And um, at, at the time with the New Orleans Film Fest, it, it, it was an important film. It's a beautiful film, right? For those who haven't seen it, it's like some of the first, like, you know, moving images of, of, of Black people in, in, in the US and the West. Um, alongside these sort of newer images um, kind of amalgamated together and dancing and coexisting. But I think about it now and the fact that we've been talking about showing that film um, outside of one of our villas, right? Um, this villa that was created in like the you know 1800s and has all this history on this land and how seeing those images against that villa that was owned by a black woman in one of the oldest black neighborhoods in the city and how like the, the context begins to shift um, where we're both addressing issues of like where we are right now with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Safer for us to be outside, um, bringing people to a space that they wouldn't necessarily go or that they didn't know was reopened and then showing contemporary work that has all these like historical underpinnings, right? And how um, I feel like as practitioners, like as curators, um, it, it's both exciting because it feels like kind of like the egg is cracked. Like we get to be even more experimental and push things and, and be even more supportive of the artists that we're working with. Um, and at the same time, it really matters um, in terms of like the sustainability of organizations, like, right? Like you can't just do the window dressing anymore. Like you said, you can't just have the black curator or the black artist come in and kind of like do a mic drop. You really have to think about um, how artists have organized during this period. And, and I think um, that if nothing else, artists have um, in, a, in a large way taken a lot of their power back. You know, we see artists 
initiating and signing on to a lot of these call outs. And, um, and I, and I feel like, you know, media is a way for us to reach so many different types of people, right? Even the folks that wouldn't necessarily uh, go to a museum and see a painting are going to see TikTok. They're going to see YouTube video. They're going to see something that's on an artist's Instagram page. And so it, to me, is really becomes a, a tool of how we communicate some of these changes, right? Like even if they're slow, um, we have an opportunity to, to, you know, as the practitioners within institutions and independently push the pace. It's also it. a tool that can let so many of us in. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the hugest part of it. And it, from the smallest countries and islands and places where, you know, you don't even necessarily have the instrument, but you can go to a little shop and sit down and get your information out, which is spectacular compared to how it was. 15, 20 years ago. I had a quick question for both of you. Um, you know, we've pointed out that there is this deluge of information and content, I guess, for folks who are just, you know, listening in. How do you discover what you discover? Um, and then when you do discover something, whether it's a film or an artist or uh, an issue, how do you synthesize whether it's if it's an artist something that you're interested in or if it's a film wow my friends need to know this or if it's an issue damn why am i the only one that knows or doesn't know about this how do you synthesize information because i think that's the double-edged sword with this is that we're getting a lot you know and, and actually i keep bringing up small acts because i haven't really watched a lot of films during covid because i just feel like i've been in front of a screen but Steve's one of my favorite filmmakers who, not only him, there are a number of filmmakers just from the diaspora who take you on this emotional journey. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always like a beautifully tied bow, but I'm curious, how do you find what you find that you, that's particularly interesting to you both? I'm not sure that that's a fair question for me because I'm actually inundated with film and I've got piles all around me here of stacks and stacks of films to watch, screen, judge, blah, blah, blah. So what about art? art as but, a but art is also now in, uh, in, a, in a different category because uh, a lot of people know that I'm a collector. So mm -hmm. that um, they are looking for me, approaching me. And, um, but the most interesting thing that I've discovered during this time is that there are a great many institutions trying to play catch up. Mm. We don't have a black anything, um, even art. Cece, who are you collecting? What are you, what's going on? What, what, who do you like? And But how, how do you deal with that? Because for me, depending on who's asking, mm -hmm. there's a consultation fee. You see, that's that, that perfect. But what I will do now is I will refer you, Larry Ose Mensa. I will refer you. Yeah. And, um, because um, for me, it, it just depends in a funny way. It does depend on, on who is calling, particularly if it's a professional call. Um, then I would like to see, you know, well, who have you already got? How long have you ever looked in this direction? And what are you looking to build? Are you looking to have five paintings by black artists? So you can say, oh yes, we've got sound so and You know, um, sidebar story, I went to the New Orleans Museum, uh, World War II Museum. We were filming inside the museum and they had um, a series of pinups of the uh, World War II pinups. And there was this massive, a wall with uh, black and white photos covering all these different girls. And I, as I walked by and I stopped and I stared and I, I literally went from row to row to row to row. And then finally I said, Who, who's, the, uh, who's the curator for this? And uh, they, they came over to say hi. And I said, it's just amazing that you have so many um, pinups in a predominantly a heavily black community, and yet there's not one black pinup girl. Have you heard of Ebony and Jet? They were all over there. So if you check Ebony and Jet, you'll probably be able to pull some. And that person just looked at the thing and they, they went, 
Oh, there's one. Oh no, maybe not. <laughs> that was their offering. Well, that is not likely to happen anymore. And that's what the transformation of time has done. And that's, I'm, I've been here for six years. And within that six year period, I know that there's a transformation of inclusivity, whether it's for uh, a financial benefit or for just a societal change, it's time to change. And um, I, I see that coming. I see that coming in film in terms of, um, when we first started, well, who did your hair? It was simple stuff. Who did your hair? Have you ever dealt with this before? Um, to the makeup, well, no, no, this is like, you know, colored man too, and, but it doesn't go. And you've watched this huge transition of inviting people of diverse knowledge into your industry. And so each movement, because it does take a movement to push it, expands the inclusivity of it and there is something about this coming season that has created a fear um, which is it saddens me really it's i hire you in fear of in the event of i'm not cp i'm not this i'm not that and i need to have all of these things as opposed to this is a great enhancement for my company this is opening my company to a whole new sector of people. And I think the films that are coming in, the artwork that's coming in, is doing a very similar job, really. Yeah. That's, that's, really, that's, that's really interesting. It makes me think about um, where's the space for us to be critical of, you know, work by, um, by black artists and artists of the diaspora and um, and and what that means right now in, in terms of um, the kind of sensitivities that come up when it's it's not a regular part of you know programming and how we're engaging um, but how important it actually is you know for mm -hmm. us to, to have those spaces where we can where we can speak critically about work um, you know in, in, in my role currently um, Larry, like I, I was mentioning earlier, I've been really kind of like tunnel vision, um, building systems and so forth. And I come up for air every now and then. And I've been really intrigued with um, a younger generation of artists that I don't always have direct access to. But um, it's funny, Instagram has become one of my more favorite platforms for that reason. Like I feel like I kind of get lost in a wormhole where um, artists can be really generous about promoting other artists. And so um, I've been really interested in like young uh, street artists who are doing work, um, folks who are creatives who don't necessarily identify with a particular medium, but I find them maybe through an event or a particular experience that um, I'm interested in. And I'm like, wow, like that really touched me or moved me. And then it's, it's, it's been, um, in some weird way kind of mapping out like who they're connected to so i've been really curious about like um these informal and like digital artist communities that that form right and how artists are like interacting with one another and and sort of collaborating so that's been um i know that's probably like the unpopular thing i'm not supposed to say you know as as an executive at a museum it's like i check out instagram but but it has really been um quite frankly, very, at most times, like really inspiring because it allows me to feel like I can get out there mm -hmm. into these worlds, um, even though I'm like anchored in a particular, very specific place. The other thing I'll mention is I feel like it also, um, it helps me to create mental maps of how different themes are connected to the work that I'm doing in a, like, you know, in a place, in a specific place that has a, you know, a rich history um, and where I might need to push back, right, against, against, um, you know, some, some of those, like, more traditional narratives and say, like, well, wh what's missing, you know, how do we make sure that we're stretching uh, mm -hmm. this Black experience so that we're 
not just simply excuse me, promoting and presenting this monolithic experience of, of blackness. Um, so that's been fun to really push myself to think about like something that might make me uncomfortable or that I'm unfamiliar with. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that kind of like. I also think we're in a fantastic place where there is actually finally enough film, enough art for us to gain a critical hold and not simply grab it because the image matches mine and like, it's, that's what I want. And now we can go much further beyond. We can, we can go beyond, um, it matches my sofa. We can go beyond the emotional feeling of like, I only uh, collect black women. Now there is an expansive amount of art. There is a huge amount of film and it's not necessarily, um, uh, the word I'm looking for is uh, traditional. You can get film on this tiny little instrument here, the iPhone. You can make a film. You can um, show it within your club. You can blow up and have 50,000 hits. You, you have a different avenue into creating art, which for us, is essential because that other avenue was so blocked for so long that I think the miracle of the whole thing is that somebody knocked and knocked on the door and then just got fed up and said, all right, I will make my film for 1095. And this is what it is. And it's still related. It still made sense. And that's, I think, the most important thing that all of us can learn that art, whether it be film or whether it be on paper or canvas, has a way to viscerally arriving at our door if we just look at another medium and not poo poo it and not look at, oh no, 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 well, that's, that's not in the gallery or oh, no, I, I didn't see it in the cinema. Um, and then it becomes the talk and then it spreads on its own and it's, mm -hmm. it goes viral as the words go. And, um, <laughs> And we're off to a whole new world, a whole new universe of film that we never had before. We were never had access to before. Yeah, just to, to piggyback your point, because someone asked the question about what will it take to make this sustainable. I think yeah. you both have pointed it out. Artists, just, they have been taking control, but like truly taking control. Like what's beginning to happen here in New York is that you're now starting to see artists kind of form, which is not a new idea, but these kind of crews and cliques and putting each other into shows, but they're in like, you know, derelict storefronts. They're not in like polished white cubes. And for someone like me, that's exciting because it's always about the discovery, right? And I know who, uh, what group or what entity traditionally is the spark for a cultural excitement. Um, that was one thing. The other thing is I've been spending a lot of time looking back. You know, if you looked at my table, I mean, I just bought a book on Bob Thompson, mm -hmm. um, Benny Andrews. You know, I think it's also important for us to kind of look back at the artists who have set the precedent set a foundation same thing with filmmakers there's a film i don't recall the name of it but it was done in the early 80s that bam screened i think either at the top of the year or late last year it was like beautiful kind of love story you know super artsy but looking back for those films that maybe came out you know and only a few people knew about you know and how do we reintroduce them to a, a newer audience yeah I think one thing that we don't have that say England is blessed with because like there's at least the June Giovanni Pan-African archives, film archives. We don't have an archivist here yet. Mm -hmm. uh, collecting those early black films, we have festivals and um, Art Matin is fantastic, but we don't have a place that we can actually physically go to and find those old films. So it's something that you sort of have to in your computer if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, but, I just, it, yeah. mm -hmm. sorry, but it goes back to what we talked about earlier about the need for infrastructure if you want these things to be sustainable. Yeah. 
So having an archive where now if you are a young filmmaker, you know, you want to learn about films that were made on 16 millimeter by black filmmakers, you can, you can have that, you know, and study that. And, you know, because it's, it's the converse thing to your point, Gia, is that like, and both of you, is that now that there is this abundance, how do we be critical and make sure that what's coming out is there's a rigorous approach to it? And we're not just accepting it because it's a, a black and brown face, but that mm -hmm. it really is, is, is pushing us, you know, whether it's making us uncomfortable, uh, uh, inspiring us, whatever the case may be, because that's a concern that I have, you know, with the fervor around black figuration right now in the market. And, you know, I've kind of started to focus more on abstraction you know, just to kind of cleanse the palate because you get to a point where like, is this really good or do I like it? Because it's like part of this deluge of offerings. So I think, I think that's one thing that's important for all of us is that now we got to make sure the rigor is there and that it's, it's, it's quality and we're not accepting it just because the, the, the maker looks like us. And then in the case where it's not quality, if there's an opportunity to engage with that artist and mentor them or give them feedback, um, I think also utilizing those opportunities as well. Yeah, it's so true. I, like, I think when I think about um, emerging artists, that something that I, that I saw or got, um, even if they, they were not explicit in communicating that or articulating that, but that they um, had made a commitment to a practice over time, right? It's like and coming, being able to come back to work and see growth, and and mm -hmm. and is it, that's always so exciting. So this this idea that like, you know, we get to help nurture um, an artist's growth over time, and that that really does come with um, asking those critical questions, right? And and challenging. Um, them in many ways, right? And and that um, again in this in this world where again everyone is creative and everyone can make things. Um, how do you then begin to um, you know allow the sort of queen to rise to the to the top? Those folks who are who are really dedicated to a particular craft and to a particular kind of purpose. Um, and so somebody else asked, what does winning in the art world look like? And and I felt like I needed another second to think about it. And so I posed that to my fellow panelists, like what does winning look like now? I, I try not to operate in the <laughs> bind of winning and losing. Um, for me, it's, it's growth, it's more opportunities for all of us to, you know, self-actualize. Self -actualize. Um, and having space to fail. Like I, I did a live the other day with Deborah Roberts. Deborah's um, I would say uh, working towards mastery in terms of where she is in her career. And she talked about the importance of failure in order to get to the next level. Like I'm sure CC you've met filmmakers where like the first film was, it was just like, uh, but like there would, it's the seeds, like, you know, whether it's like particular angles that they're getting like, Oh, that's interesting. Or like the writing is, and the dialogue is great, but maybe the acting is, or the lighting, whatever. Like, you know, I know for me, I'm always looking for those seeds because it's like, it's rare that like an artist comes out and they're amazing, you know? And it's like, you know, so I think winning is having space to grow, having space to like, you know, not be a shooting star, but to be able to kind of just like develop, experiment. Um, because I, I get concerned with, you know, if we're talking about filmmaking, where it's like, you know, there was a moment where those mega blockbuster films was all that was coming out, and now you, you shut down the cinema, and it's like, ah, you know, does 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 Avengers have its same gravitas? You know, that's formulaic, yeah. You know, but I think it's it's. You know, it's this, it's this interesting course correct that, like, creativity always has to be at the core. You'll be able to, you know, get away with it for so long, but at some point, you know, the, you know, the wool is going to be 
pulled and you're going to have to deal with what is this really what is like the core the essence and so i think if we're talking about winning winning is being authentic really getting to the core being truly creative um and having the infrastructure to do so um i think when you get into formulas like i'm seeing it a little bit where like you know artists who were sculptors are primarily like abstract artists not saying you got to be couched in a space all of a sudden they make a figurative work and i'm looking at them with a side eye i'm not saying nothing but i'm like i do see you you know so i think not falling into this trap of trends i think is also something to be mindful of I'll that's up. tough larry because that means that you feel like an, a, an artist gets his wings clipped if he tries something new or goes down a, a, a different avenue if he has been accustomed like this is what you're known for and yet there are artists who they do a similar but more marvelous thing over and over again and when mm -hmm. they want to try something new then they get uh but that's not what you do well i'm not saying that you can't I mean, these artists I know personally, so I could smell the milk is funky, you know? I mean, of course I want the artists to, 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 to experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think there's also ways that strategically you can do that and kind of gently introduce your audience to a new direction. I don't think you, you, you can't, but like, I get suspicious when it's like, you know, you were doing one thing yesterday and then now you're doing something all of a sudden. And so like, you know, and if and if it is the case where like you truly are committed to this new direction, you know, helping take us on that journey. You know, yeah, I think it's, it's like it's not a one size fits all, right? Like that's yeah. that part of it is that um, you know, there there isn't a like follow this rubric and this is what success means or this is what winning looks like or even this is this is what what this feels like. I think the beautiful thing about the creative process is that it is in fact a process which is kind of counter to you know the way in which the art world works the art market works right which is the commodification of a thing mm -hmm. um and i i just feel like there's something like we can learn from like being deeply immersed in process and mm -hmm. you know it keeps mm -hmm. us present so for me I, I think that there's some really practical things that um that artists um me right like and it it, it it runs along class lines it's like you know affordable housing and access to workspace and health care and the things that make human beings in general like sustainable mm -hmm. um i don't think that's different per se for artists um and i think but i think it's important um especially when we when we think about what we're asking artists to do and and then i also think about the way in which we fund um science right like um science and, and art the processes are very similar in that like we're, we're asking you know scientists and artists to make an inquiry to interrogate something without knowing what the outcome is going to be um that will be you know for public good or to, to sort of better serve and yet we fund science like very different than we fund the arts you know mm -hmm. um there, there's um, there's just a different um, kind of hierarchy or way that we think about those two things, and we're willing to to kind of fund scientific inquiry and process, but we don't think about it in that way when an artist takes on like a new a new juncture or a new path. Um, so for me, winning is is kind of it's around those logistical things, but it's also a, around shifting, at least here in the West, our um the way in which we view the art making process like i think more of us need to be more educated more immersed in what that looks like and how we can incorporate it into our own lives um and you know specifically thinking about film and this idea that like you're literally cutting up these slices these moments right to try to get to this contiguous thing that somehow makes sense and somehow brings you into this other world and for me, you know, um, winning can't really be defined, right? Uh, to me, while an artist is, 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 is still in the process of putting all of this work together, it just, it's about them having the things that they need to continue to produce and continue to be creative. And that means many different things for many different people. I know I've been really creative sometimes when I've been in need, right? 
and um, and had to uh, say, I've got this and I've got this, you know, how do I put it together and create something new? And, um, you know, but for other artists, they need, they're at a stage in their life where they need some additional resources. So I think though, you know, to, to sort of answer that person's question, I think that there there is no one size fits all, but I think if we can expand it to humanity and what we need as human beings, we can include artists obviously in that conversation of, of what we what we need for human rights right and human sustainability what do you think larry no i mean I, I i totally agree i mean i think one thing that a question that i had just piggybacking that because i was talking to an artist and they said they don't feel like artists are respected enough you know like think at the beginning of COVID, i was looking at the stimulus package number I think it was 250 million out of 2 trillion, something like that. You know, and then talking to colleagues in Berlin who were like, you know, I forget the number that the government was giving, but it was significantly more. Mm -hmm. So it just makes me wonder, you know, going back to this question about infrastructure, what will it take to get people to respect the arts on the level of science, on the level of sports, you know? Um, <clears throat> technology, you know. Um, so, I mean, those are things that I wonder about is like, you know, what will it take to get garnered like true respect? Because we know you took away cinema in terms of going to the theater and people like started freaking out. And then to your point, Gia, now we got driving to so coming back, you know, and, and to see friends and family, like we're going to the drive-in yeah, and like, yeah parking lots being converted, you know, so I think, you know, the ingenuity is always going to be there. Um, and I think that's the beauty of people, particularly black people, because, you know, wherever you are, you've basically had to take, you know, this and this and make something magical happen. Um, that's the word I was waiting to hear, magical. You know. And I think that's the huge difference, Gia, between science and art mm. is that because magic is involved in mystery that mm. you cannot harness it and you cannot logistically put it together and it come out the same catechate way every time mm. while with science with formula things put together it will eventually all come out a certain way every single time i think it throws people off it frightens people and therefore mm -hmm. it's not truly uh, an elemental part of what a human person needs, you know, mm -hmm. and it frightens people that that through music, through a film, that you can actually transport or transform someone into a completely different human being, and that's not readily acceptable because it's a little bit magical. It's a little bit, you know, of the darker art. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think it would take to begin to shift that? Let's specifically talking about within the diaspora, because I'm sure there are people who get it and there's still people who don't. Well, I believe it's only the diaspora who can do it. Hmm. So I believe that the diaspora has to actually listen to themselves hmm. and bring their art to the front line and not have it judged by anybody else but them. And mm. I think that pushes a change where other people begin to listen to, oh, that's how they're thinking. That's what's creating that. And that's one of the things that we don't do because we don't use ourselves as our own judges. Mm. You know, it's interesting you should say this. I, it, it, yesterday I was meeting with a young artist um, about the subject of gentrification. He's working on a project. And I was, you know, I was talking to him about how excited I am about the younger generation and the way in which they are approaching access or the lack of access to spaces and how they, you know, the pop-ups, right? We've seen the resurgence of pop-ups in the last like sort of decade or so and how much control there is in, in the pop-up. Like this idea that, you know, there was a thing, there's a container that, that can hold things and that you can insert a particular experience and you can also take it away. Like there's a lot of ownership. So even though you may not own the cube or you may not have control over you know, the physical space, 
you're able to create environments. And we talked about that around like this idea of like the wormholes, right? Like that you can, you can try all of these things. And that in particular for black folks, like giving us space to, as you say, like see ourselves for ourselves, like in, 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 in all of the sort of um, complexities is really essential. And, um, and I think it's in those little moments of time that those that that can happen and it can perpetuate into you know more, more expansive or, or, or longer moments of time so i was just complimenting them it was so funny to be kind of like the older person in the room complimenting like the younger artists right i was like wow i'm really here okay good job guys good job keep it keep it you know keep it up <laughs> so if i may interject um, because this is such an interesting conversation. Um, it's hard to like stop you guys because you're clearly in a flow. <laughs> um, clearly. Um, I, we, we have three questions from um, some of the um, attendees. So I just wanted to pose them to you all. Um, so one of the questions was, um, um, if, if there were particular connections and examples of African noir film or filmmakers um, and how they influence how the influence of their work might be seen in work in visual in visual work that you've seen, whether that be in prism or otherwise. Um, that's question one. Question true two is um, which many of you you you've already touched on this was what does winning look like in the art world? Um, and then the third question is um, I I would like to know the um, from the panelists ideas and concerns as cultural practitioners sharing and giving access to black artists while navigating capitalism and the breakdown of um, I guess artistic in, or institutions <laughs> broadly speaking how are they creating their own spaces and own systems by fully valuing the artists and the local community and I think you all touched on some of those some of those subject matters but. I thought I would give you all an opportunity. The, the very last question was actually a little bit complicated. I didn't quite catch what they needed to know. Um, let me see who who was the, I think it was. Um, Maybe they can ask Danae. it. Danae, would you mind just um, unmuting yourself and, and asking the question fully, if you're there? I guess she's not. Hey, how are you guys doing? Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be with us this evening. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, as an artist, um, and speaking to you um, as curators, how, how are you going about working with artists specifically um, to aid in local community um, and understanding how capitalism works and just the extraction of extraction and then the commodification of blackness through institutions um, I think the for myself as an artist, but also as a curator, the only way that I am able to pour into myself into my community is by aiding specifically locally. But I'm on, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and how how you go about that. I think each of us will probably have a different answer for that. So I'll do mine very briefly, and then I think we should all three answer it because they're it's so completely different for each one of us. Um, I deal with the African diaspora, so that's where I am looking to support. Most of those artists, um, the support is rare that, like for instance, a boatload of visitors might come into town, they might have a gallery show at the time, and they get a painting sold. And then it's just fighting for themselves until something else, what other, other jobs they might be doing. I on the diaspora find an artist that I have a particular interest in is something that I like the way he or she works. And I follow that artist pretty much until they're dead. And I support that artist pretty much until they're dead and gone. And um, I don't know how it is that I started that practice but I think it does explain that because of the size of my, um, my collection, it kind of explains that because sometimes an artist is willing to give up work because they must eat. And other times, what I try to encourage artists to do is 
a very specific work, a work that has meaning, it comes from something, they've painted it for a reason. It has everything in it, it has drama, it has passion, it has, I had to finish this, I make sure that they don't let go of it until they have to, and until it's worth it. And even if I am the person who wants it. So, and that I'll do with the young artists until they mature to something else. And uh, for the diaspora, I think I've created a, a nice dent in that kind of support. And I've done it mildly in the United States with African-American artists who I still follow. I, I have like about five artists that I've been following for 25 years and supporting. Larry? Um, well, I think taking the hyper-local approach is, is wise because um, I always think about how do you impact your immediate community? Um, people, you know, if anybody who's read Stephen Covey, your circle of influence, um, because you'll be able to identify the needs quicker and the needs don't always have to be fulfilled with money. It could just be they, an artist needs space to create, you know, hey, I got this like, you know, loft that I can split with you and, you know, to make work for your show. Um, so I think understanding the power of bartering, whatever that looks like. Um, secondly, you know, the work that we do with Art Noir, I mean, we recognized quickly at the beginning of COVID that this was going to be bad. Um, just seeing the furloughs and the layoffs. And so in July, we did an auction with Artsy and we raised like over 100K. And now what we're doing, we're using that money to uh, initiate a micro grant program. And it'll be between 500 to to $1,000 for black artists, curators, and cultural workers affected by COVID. All you have to do is apply. Um, and then on a, based on case and need, People are selected in batches of 10. So we've just done our first 10. We're about to do another 10. Um, and it's unrestricted. So if you need to pay rent, buy food, buy materials, whatever it is, um, you can do what you want with the funds if you receive it. Um, and so for me, that was just a, a practical way because I was looking at the bigger pots of money and they were having like 10, 15,000 people apply. And it was just like, okay, well, it's gonna be hard for my people to get that money, but like, you know, how can we be of service in an immediate way? You know, being very specific that this is black and brown folks that the money is for, it's not for everyone. Um, that's the second thing. And I think the third thing for me coming from a marketing background, I'm not shy to ask for the bread, you know, and understanding the value in the cultural crap capital, the, the, the creative, capital, the intellectual property that the artists, and I know people don't like those words sometimes, but that is also what you're creating. You're creating an intellectual property in my view. And so what, what tends to happen, like I'm talking to a software company now and they want to collaborate with black artists. And so like looking at the contracts and making sure that the money is legit. And if it's not, I'm like, you got to give more money to these artists or you know, it can't be a one-off project, you know, can this be a three-year commitment, you know, so multiple artists can kind of benefit. Um, can we do workshops internally with your staff? So the staff understands why these artists are selected and are going to be part of your platform, you know? So I think pushing entities and institutions to go deeper, I think is another thing that artists can do where if you're invited to be part of something, really kind of evaluating like what it is that they want you to do as an artist, you know, and that it's not just a tokenism thing, but like really pushing the institution. And I think that's something I've learned working in an institution and working in adjacent that, you know, these things are kind of like ideas, you know, that are made up of people that sometimes need to be nudged. Sometimes you got to check them as, as, as you mentioned uh, in your story, CC. Um, <laughs> And then also some people are just lost for ideas. And, that, and I, I, I look at those moments as an opportunity to be like, okay, well, now we're going to get all our friends in the door and do what we do um, and hopefully shift the way these institutions and entities work for the better. Um, 
So those are different strategies that I've, I've tried to apply, you know, and I'm always just conscious of like, what can I do that's within my wheelhouse and my control and not try to do something like, you know, like I've produced two films. Making films are very hard. <laughs> I like promoting them. So you're not going to see me like on the film festival circuit, you know, but, you know, if I come across an incredible filmmaker or a screenwriter, you know, you know, passing that information on to people who that's what they do. Um, so I think that's also the, the last point is um, referring, you know, because often, you know, an institution will be like, hey, we want to do a BIPOC show, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll just kind of look at it and then evaluate how much work is this really going to take? Um, and if it just doesn't, you know, the requests and the time and the, and the work don't uh, compute for me, I say, you know what, I can't do it, but here are 10 other curators of color, perfectly qualified, you know, will work within your budget. You need to pick one of them. And nine times out of 10, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then now they have a pool of other creatives that they can now engage and pull from. Because I'm always about like, okay, if I'm not going to get the opportunity, you know, or I, I can't work on the opportunity because I'm busy, how do I make sure that other people in my network get access to that? You know, and I've seen, you know, I, if we're using artists as an example, I think about like, what Micheline Thomas has done with her Muse series, always curating other artists, you know, into the into the situation, or what Hank Willis Thomas does with um, um, for Freedoms, or what Kehinde is doing with Black Rock, you know. So always remembering, you know, how to intentionally pay it for it. I think it's important too. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> no. I agree with all of those things, all of that. I think that's all um, super important. Uh, you know, I, I would I would offer um, doing institutional work right now. Um, I, I, I'm, it's actually somewhat challenging in that you know institutions are being criticized. So um, for me, it really is about uh, pushing forth a new culture, a new mm -hmm. way that museums operate and being mm -hmm. able to kind of concretize that, right? To be able to say like, this is how we do what we do. So here's the internal workings. So a lot of what I'm working on right now is like, how do we make our process more transparent for others? So more specifically, how do we better help artists understand how they can engage with the museum? Um, and that's a lot of relationship building. So, you know, um, just really reaching out to people, um, making sure that they know that the, the values that we have are not just on paper, but like here's how we plan to like actually engage in these value propositions. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's, it's really important um, in the work at the New Orleans African American Museum to create pipelines. So a lot of our infrastructure um, right now is centered around mentorship and around creating pipelines, not just for curators, although that's a focus of ours, but also for other administrators who want to do work within the, within the museum world. I mean, it could be archivists, it could be writers and, you know, and just other, other cultural critics who are interested in having a platform. You know, I think it's, for me, it's important that we are offering a platform for others to um, to grow and to expand, right? Um, we've also been trying through COVID to really think about how do we help pair artists and curators um, since we can use these online and digital platforms. So we, you know, we we currently have you know a series called Institute, which is really about um, curators who maybe are, are also doubling, just like artists, doing other kinds of work, um, but are also developing, you know, their, their voice and, and what their interests are, and how do we pair them specifically with artists so that um, they know each other and so that we're helping to create the web and we're helping to expand, um, you know, the, 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 the circle. Um, a bit more. And then I think I'm also just really interested in, um, my, my work is always very localized. Um, it's, it's always in how do you use the assets that you have? I mean, currently right now, you know, 
we're having to think about like, how do we host small groups of people um, where we just give the museum over as a place for people to meet and to do things that they don't have a place to work. Um, and for us, it's the kind of loosely framed program called Museum Takeover, but it's directly pushing back against this idea of how museums started, like the colonial way in which museums have traditionally operated, right? Which was for the elite, which is for a small group of people. Um, and so it, it feels important for us to be demonstrative around um, people being able to come together, small collectives, groups that are not formal, right? To be able to utilize the spaces that we have because that's one of our assets. And then um, we've been also really interested in the digital platform of takeovers, right? Like um, taking over different spaces to share parts of our collection and then also having other um, younger groups of people take over our digital spaces to share things. So for me, it really is about an exchange and understanding that like our little drop of work is, is actually connected to a larger body of work that's happening among curators and artists and collectors. Um, and that the institution gets to kind of connect the dots between all of those different points. So I think that's a really great question. And I would, um, I would say probably give yourself kudos on the work that you are doing. I think oftentimes, you know, we see the holes or we see what isn't being done, but we don't always celebrate and acknowledge the work that we are doing. Um, and cultural production is, is, is one of um, you know, the types of labor that is often taken for granted from a curatorial standpoint, you know, from an artistic standpoint, right? People tend not to understand how to quantify uh, the work um, that, that you do. So I would just say also offer yourself a moment to think about all the things that you have contributed to your local community. Do you have a comment? Are there... Are, are there any other comments? Because I think there's so much to uh, to digest and to chew on here. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So if there are no other comments, because I know we've been in conversation, I think we've been in conversation now for an hour and 30 minutes. It's been <laughs> And it feels like it feels like it was five minutes. <laughs> it's been yeah. so short, yeah. <laughs> because the conversation has just been so riveting. It's been amazing listening to all your perspectives on a very, very wide myriad of of of, of topics. We we began by um, thinking about everything through the lens of film, but we went off into broader conversations about about institutions, how the art how art impacts community, the, the role that all of you are playing in, in trying to like shift the narrative in the middle of what is a very difficult time to, to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am so thankful for you all, for, for number one, for Cece hosting tonight's event, for lending her time and her energy um, to oh, nice. supporting PRISM and its continued mission and its vision. Um, and I'm thankful for Gia and Larry for the work that you do in your individual spaces. Um, you all have both played such a key role in developing institutions but then also the practices of, of the artists that whose work you, you touch um, daily. Um, and I'm thankful for everyone who's here today for joining us on, on a Monday afternoon or Monday evening. Um, um, I, I guess I can just end the evening by briefly letting you all know what PRISM Virtual will be about for the next couple of weeks. Um, because it's virtual, we figured that it is best to kind of just leave it open for a whole month so people can sort of experience, continue to experience it. Um, and um, what we are doing is we're having films every Thursday of the month um, with different focuses. So this month will be, uh, or this week, we'll be focusing on Miami. Um, we're showing um, a film called When Liberty Burns, um, which is from a filmmaker that's based in Miami. Um, his name is Dudley Alexis. And it's about um, the civil rights move movement here in, um, here in Miami. Um, it's the 40th anniversary of the passing of the unfortunate passing of Arthur McDuffie, um, who was tragically 
um, one could say murdered by police officers here in Miami. Um, so it's a very, it's a deep dive into Miami's history, how it was impacted by his passing. And, um, and we'll have a conversation subsequent to that with the filmmaker and um, a photographer here in Miami who does documentary work of black, of, of black life here in, in Florida, South Florida and in Miami. Um, and then subsequently following weeks, we'll have another film screening. Um, we'll have, we're gonna have a conversation with Tiana Webb Evans, um, who has a project called Yard, Yard Concepts. It's, a, it's an amazing project. Um, it's about healing, it's about transformation, it's about thinking about um, our, our work as theology in many ways and how to use that, how to use our artistic narratives to um, reshape our lives in, in a more positive way. Um, and, um, and I really hope you enjoy it. Um, it took a lot of doing to transition from um, seeing your lovely faces in person to creating an optimized experience for you in a virtual space. Um, so this is a labor of love. Go ahead, Larry. No, I was going to just say, going back to this question about winning, and you said eight years, and I was like, wait, what? You know, because I've been coming to Miami for Basel. This would have been 13 years. And mm -hmm. I think going back to winning and supporting platforms and entities like prison. Because mm -hmm. Mikhail has been making this happen by hook or by crook. By hook or by crook. <laughs> and every year I'm just like, how? <laughs> and we're incredibly proud of you for that. Yeah. Believe. No, I mean, Unbelievable. Like literally I was in Miami, I think two weekends ago, and we saw each other. And she was like, hey. I'm doing this thing. I'm like, all right, when? It was like literally just the date and time if I'm available, it's a yes. You know, and I think, you know, supporting and 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 over supporting because I think what Mikhail has built is is important, um, difficult to replicate. Um it's a singular experience. And actually the silver lining within this is that. Experiencing PRISM, I think, online now, I think is going to open up the possibilities for PRISM to be more present throughout the year and not just during, you know, December. And that's what I'm excited about, you know, PRISM being able to be present in February during freeze or in, and you don't have to deal with the overhead of like physically being in space because you've consistently done an incredible job of finding like the the best minds are i'm always discovering artists when i go to prison you know and i can't say that for your your colleagues um at other fairs and so i think one thank you for the work that you do um providing us the space to fellowship and, and gather and you know sticking with it because i know this is not easy it's a capital intensive thing um you're in a city that is not you know, very welcoming to our people. And I don't think we always talk about that. Um, and I think making this distinction between Miami and Miami Beach, it's two different things. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you um, for what you've done. And anyway, we in this space can continue to support, um, let us know. Thank you so much for that, Larry. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think I'm proclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think it's I think it's great that you all are like such avid supporters of of Prism that it that we've been able to do this together because really I literally could not do this with the support without the support of many of you who are on this call. Each of you are literally like just calling and making sure that I'm alive and making sure that I'm that I still have a pulse <laughs> through all of this. Um, and I am I am motivated by the belief that you have in me to to push this forward um, because I, I really can't do it without without your support. Um, we have board members on the call who like Taib, who um, who I text when I <laughs> when I'm having a, a rough day. <laughs> um, and um, Kimberly Green was on earlier, who's also um, uh, the um, the founder of the Green Family Foundation that has been one of the initial supporters of PRISM back in 2014. They've been supporting us for, for seven years now. So 
Um, it has been a, a collective, it is, PRISM is like the manifestation of what a community engaged organization can look like because it's literally been built by us communing together and us, I'm the, I guess I'm the vehicle for the vision, but the vision is supported. It has many wheels. It's, a, it, it's an 18 wheeler. PRISM is an 18 wheeler. <laughs> so, um, so I am, I am thank again, I'm deeply thankful for all of you. I, if, I hope you all enjoy the fair. Um, I hope you will come back to see screenings. I hope you will come back for our subsequent panel talks. Um, if you all have any emails or questions about any of the work, there's a lot of work. There's over 300 works on the platform. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know. I'm also um, a huge believer that we should be collecting our work. So definitely, if you have the resources, the resources support the artists. We, we, do, we do have a commission-based, um, I guess, platform, but really most of the, 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 the funding goes to the artist. So that is hugely important to us. We wanted to make sure we weren't uh, like a vehicle that's similar to what already exists or, or what the status quo is. Um, so yeah, um, the dates are between December 1st, beginning tomorrow, through the 21st, which is about three weeks from now, right before Christmas. So if you if you have a, a, a good friend that you want, want to buy a nice piece for, <laughs> you can do that, help them start their art collection. If you want to, if you want to add to your own art collection, uh, you can do that. And I'm sure you can talk to Cece, Larry, or Gia about, about the whole the whole infrastructure around art and collecting it. Um, we're all in good company here. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yes, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Please be safe. Um, please wear your masks. Um, uh, if you all can commune with each other, even if you guys can, 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 can uh, share um, inf um, contact information, um, that's good too. Um, and I love you all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, I guess I have a quick reminder, and that is through PRISM, I'm going to do uh, a collector uh, collecting during COVID time for us. So that video will show up shortly. Yes. Um, wonderful talking with you, Larry and Gia. Thank you so much. You. Made my hosting like so easy. <laughs> Thanks. It was fun to see you all again. Great yeah. to see you guys too. Yeah. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.